Hey, welcome everybody to our midweek update. And man, as we look at things, Earth's darkest hour is coming. It looks like it's rapidly approaching. A time of darkness, destruction, anger, and judgment looms over the earth is what the Bible tells us when we come to the last days. In Joel chapter 2, for example, the Bible describes the darkness for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Joel chapter 1 warns of destruction where there, Joel writes, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. And then we think of just some of the news uh, from this week. Uh, here's this. Uh, deep fakes pose serious threat to democracy, says Google chief. Well, guess who's behind all of this stuff? These tech giants and the government who I believe wants to destroy the United States of America. Here's another article from this week. Imam recites Quran at Belgian parliament calls for killing Jews. Another one, government floats plan to freeze bank accounts of right-wing extremists in Germany. Well, who defines a right-wing extremist? Let's close their bank accounts. Wait till CBDC comes. And then they'll have complete control over your bank accounts. And then there's this. This just shows you how far along we are in society. U.S. Census to ask questions on gender identity, sexual orientation for first time. It just goes on from here. Uh, and, and you start thinking of this, you put it, the attention on Israel. Israeli cabinet rejects international recognition of Palestinian state, which I wholeheartedly agree with because we know Antichrist is going to seek to divide the land for gain. Daniel chapter 11 tells us, and God also says in Joel chapter 3, that he will judge all the nations that divide his land. And then we also have this, Ben Gavir says he wants to bar Palestinians from Temple Mount over Ramadan. I mean, talk about starting more problems over in Israel, throwing some gasoline on the fire that you already got there. But we see everything go in this direction, and ultimately the attention will be there in Jerusalem. But wait, there's a few more things. Listen to this. Scientists resort to once unthinkable solutions to cool the planet. I'm not making this up. This is out of the Wall Street Journal. Three geoengineering projects seek to alter the chemistry of the atmosphere and the ocean. And critics warn of unintended consequences. Listen, everybody, this really is happening as we look at all of these things. But as we move forward, listen, we cannot be afraid. Don't live in fear. Don't listen to the, those voices that want to shout you down and you know that all of these things point to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we're going to do between now and when he calls us home. Let's you and I do all that we can for the kingdom of Christ. We, we move forward with the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, listen, just a quick reminder. I know I mentioned this before. I'm going to mention it to you again right now. We have these great opportunities opening up in Mexico coming in the summer. We have radio in Mexico uh, coming real soon. And then this summer, we get to minister to a group of pastors and church leaders in Mexico with the hope of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, teaching them how to teach Bible prophecy. And then we have a prophecy conference coming up in Mexico too. As I mentioned, give you more information on that real soon. But in the meantime, please pray because, listen, the, the, the spiritual attacks are always there, but we're going to move forward. We really need your prayer more than anything else, and we also really appreciate uh, your support for ministry. And as you give to Hope for Our Times, uh, know this, that your work is going to the forward, uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that hope would go to the entire world. So I just want to thank you guys. And uh, again, more than anything, we really, really need your Prayer. Don't just say you're going to pray, but really pray. All right, let's go back to our program as we're looking at Earth's darkest hour. So Romans chapter 2, verse 5, uh, in one translation says, a day of anger is coming. Instead of anger, other translations say wrath. Well, whose wrath? It's God's wrath. His anger has been a long time coming, and that slowness uh, gives some people the wrong impression. They hear that God is good and that God is true, God is neither cruel nor mean. He is gracious and kind. At least five times the Bible describes God as slow to anger. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17 says, 
you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness. Psalm 145, verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great mercy. Joel chapter 2 pleads, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And Naaman chapter 1 reminds us that God is slow to anger, but that verse also gives us a powerful warning to all who view his reluctance to unleash wrath as their license to sin, where there Nahum writes, uh, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. In other words, you're not going to get away with your wickedness forever. God knows and God will judge. Listen, don't confuse God's silence with God's approval. Second Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 9 says, the Lord does not slack concerning his promise, as some can count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. Uh, do not let his long-suffering confuse you. He will eventually unleash wrath upon the world and its people. In my mind, I can hear someone saying, uh, that's not the God I serve. Listen, let me tell you something of crucial importance. If that is not the God you serve, then you do not serve the God of the Bible. Why, why do you think Jesus died on the cross? Because God gave us the ability to make real choices, and real choices have real consequences. The true and living God promises anger and judgment on the world and on those of its people who refuse to repent and receive Christ's free gift of salvation from wrath. Think again, why did Jesus come? Why did he go to the cross if sin didn't need to be judged? Sin was judged in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sin. But listen, God's wrath is coming upon this planet also. And God tells us, why would he tell us that in his word if it weren't true? As many Bible teachers say, you just need to ignore that. Um, it's not really happening. Why do you talk about these things? Because the Bible does and God tells us to warn, like watchmen. Listen, the day of the Lord, uh, regarding the day of the Lord, we've already looked at several Bible verses containing the phrase, the day of the Lord. Uh, this phrase refers to a future time period containing a specific series of events. It's also called the day of Jehovah or Yahweh, uh, that day and the great day. We find it throughout the Bible, more than 75 times in the Old Testament alone and many times even in the New Testament. All these references contain the element of judgment, uh, judgment of Israel and of other nations, judgment of individuals and of the human race. But in all those scriptures, you never find the day of the Lord described as a time of judgment of the church or individual followers of Jesus. Listen, that's good news. Uh, the King James Bible begins its translation of Isaiah 13, beginning of verse six, with words we don't often hear. Howl ye, you just picture a dog howling. Someone yelling. That is the sound of pain in, in raw, a primal sense. It says, howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The New King James says, wail, uh, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp, every man's heart will melt, and they will be afraid. As you can see, the day of the Lord will be a horrible time for those who must endure it. Isaiah chapter 13, verse nine through 10, lets us know that the darkness described will not just be metaphorical, part of that day will be a time of literal physical darkness. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he, the Lord, will destroy sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Uh, people say that's never gonna happen. Even people who believe the Bible, yet they'll say it will happen uh, when you look at the sun standing still in the days of Joshua, and you look at these events in the Old Testament, and they say, well, happen then, but this isn't going to happen in the future. Well, according to the Bible, this darkness really will happen. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 8, as, as the sun is control, 
control. But as we continue, Isaiah chapter 34, verse 8, and Jeremiah 46, verse 10, call it a day of vengeance. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 22, calls it the day of the Lord's anger. Joel chapter 2, verse 1, says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. When will the day of the Lord come? In his classic eschatological book, Things to Come, Dwight Pentecost wrote, the term day of the Lord or that day is not a term which applies to a 24-hour period, but rather the whole program of events, including the tribulation period, the second advent program, and the entire millennial age. I recently spoke on Daniel's 70th week and also called uh, the tribulation. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 teaches us that this time, uh, that time period will begin when the Antichrist confirms a covenant with Israel. The day of the Lord begins at that time. Both Daniel and Jesus speak of an awful change at the halfway point of the seven years, the seven year period. In, in, in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 15, Jesus showed how severe this moment in history will be. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. He was speaking to the tribulation era Jewish believers living in the region of Jerusalem. He said that when Antichrist does this egregious thing in the temple, get out of there and get out quick. If you're out in the field, don't even go back home to pack a bag. Just flee, he said. Flee to the mountains. Uh, despite the fact that none of the online dictionaries I could find made the connection, I'm sure this is where we get the English phrase, make for the hills and head for the hills. Uh, for there will be great tribulation, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Listen, when Jesus says flee, if he is making that much of a warning during that time in the tribulation, baby, you better flee as fast as you possibly can. Zechariah chapter 14, beginning in verse one, describes why the people in Judea should run when they see the abomination of desolation. It also gives uh, several uh, day of the Lord events that coincide with the tribulation. Then it takes us to the end of the tribulation and the return of Jesus, all of which is part of the day of the Lord. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 shows us that the day of the Lord will extend even further out in time, where the Bible says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. He takes it all the way through the millennial kingdom uh, to the point just before the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. That time frame includes the resurrection of sinners in the great white throne judgment. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment and would naturally include those events. You might wonder why the millennium uh, would be considered part of the day when the Lord purges evil from the world. Well, the millennium will be wonderful. Jesus will reign and Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit, but things will not yet be perfect. Jesus must rule that time with a rod of iron. Uh, think about why. And even after his 1,000 year reign on earth, there will still need to be more cleansing. That is illustrated by the fact that after the millennium, when Satan is released from the bottomless pit, he will be able to build a massive human army in a final war of rebellion against God. The crushing of that rebellion along with the judgment of Satan 
and of those who follow him are also part of the day of the Lord. Listen, the day of the Lord lasts all the way to a point shortly before Jesus will make all things new. But when exactly will the day of the Lord begin? We find out that answer when we look at what the Bible says about the day of the Lord Jesus. Up to now, I've been describing the day of the Lord. Most of it is pretty rough, pretty dark, pretty brutal. But the day of Christ or the day of the Lord Jesus is just the opposite. It's something to look forward to and rejoice over. Uh, the day of the Lord Jesus refers to the rapture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says, Who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, it's better that he suffers now than miss the rapture. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. We are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. So you can see the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord Jesus. And the day of the Lord Jesus. Listen, this is where we have our hope. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And when's that? After the rapture, we who are in Christ will have new bodies and sin will no longer be an issue for us. We will have arrived. But before that, during our time on earth, in these mortal bodies, we can rest in the assurance that he will continue the good work he has begun in us, even as we still live on earth in these mortal bodies. And Philippians chapter 1, verse 10 says that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Again, the day of the Lord Jesus or the day of Christ. After the rapture, sin will no longer be an issue for us, as I mentioned. But before then, we want to remain without offense all the way to the rapture. Philippians chapter 2, verse 16 says, Holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. There it is. Again, the day of the Lord Jesus, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of Christ. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. At the rapture, your spiritual leaders and mentors will rejoice in seeing you in heaven, knowing that their work on your behalf was not wasted. We also see this if we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul had taught the Christians of Thessalonica about a pre-tribulation rapture. But someone had been telling them that the rapture had already occurred, that they had missed it. And now they were living in the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. Apparently, someone had been circulating a forged letter supposedly from Paul pushing this fake news. The Thessalonian Christians knew enough about the day of the Lord to be terrorized by this thought. Interesting in this, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, answers their concerns by reminding them of the things that he had taught them earlier. Where Paul said, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord had come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Other Bibles, such as the New King James and the King James, uh, seem to make a separation from the day of Christ referring to the rapture and that day referring to the day of judgment or the day of the Lord. Either way, it works out the same. The rapture needs no signs to be fulfilled before it happens. We're always watching for it, knowing that it could happen at any second. 
the rapture is imminent, but the day of the Lord is different. Before it comes, certain things must happen to fulfill Bible prophecy, including the revealing of Antichrist. And we know from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that the seven years of tribulation begin with Antichrist's treaty with Israel. For him uh, to make this major treaty requires that he first come to global prominence. In other words, the man of lawlessness must first be revealed before Daniel's 70th week can begin or at the same time. When you think about it, it makes perfect sense. The scripture is interesting in another way. Daniel and Jesus talked about Antichrist's desecration of the temple. This verse tells us more specifically how he will do that. It says he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. In all of this, we find great hope. We see the day of the Lord taking shape. All of the signs of the day of the Lord are converging. But for us, we know that the day of Jesus is coming. The day of Christ is coming. So before the judgment comes our going home. Uh, friends, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the best place to be. The Bible tells us that we, it teaches that we are going to be transformed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, that there's a generation of believers as the last days are approaching, the day of judgment is approaching. Before that day of judgment, before the day of the Lord begins, before Antichrist appears, that there's a generation of believers that will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's the day of Christ or the day of Jesus our Lord. It is the hope that we have in knowing him. Listen, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, you are saved. But the greatest message that we have is that Jesus came the first time to forgive us of our sins. Listen, friends, everything is happening exactly as the Bible says it is going to happen. If you're wondering what in the world is going on, the Bible tells us what in the world is going on because it told us over 2,000 years ago, this is what to look for just before that day. And it's proof that Jesus is coming again, but it's also proof that he came the first time to forgive us of our sins. And the Bible's clear, there's no other name under heaven by which a person can be saved than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, if you've trusted anything else for your salvation, religion, any guru, anything at all, you will not be forgiven. You must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He came, he was put upon the cross, he died for the sins of anyone who would believe in him. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Jesus himself said, I will in no way cast out anybody who comes to me. Listen, if you want to know you're forgiven, ask Christ to forgive you. Turn to him and he will turn to you. God bless.